Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Teleshadowing. We are recording this session and live streaming it to YouTube. We will be having a Q&A session at the end, and you can ask questions in the YouTube Live and Zoom chats, and they will be addressed. I'm honored to introduce my mentor, our mentor for today, Dr. Fowler. Dr. Fowler is the Professor of Emergency Medicine and Emergency Medical Services, Chief of the Division of Emergency Medical Services, and the James M. Atkins, MD, Distinguished Professor of Emergency Medical Services at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, and attending EMS faculty at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Fowler serves on the Board of Admissions at UTSW as well. We also wanted to wish Dr. Fowler a happy birthday, and now and I really appreciate Dr. Fowler coming in today, giving us his time and volunteering. And now I'd like to request Dr. Fowler to begin today's session. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and that was awfully, <laughs> awfully kind. Let's see. You need to stop sharing so I can share. Right there, we are. All right, here we go, and off we go. Well, welcome everybody. It's so good to have you all here. I'm just absolutely delighted uh, to uh, join you this morning. And uh, my uh, my guest and my uh, uh, research assistant is Adidia Govind, who's with us this morning. Uh, Adidia is on a gap year from Southern Methodist University, and he is research assistant to the division of EMS. <clears throat> I want to talk to you a bit about why in the world you should get into medicine as I talk to you about my own pathway. There's a marvelous book you ought to read. It's not very long by John Hershey uh, named Hiroshima. And it is the story of what happened that day on August the 6th, 1945 at 8.15 in the morning when a 13 or so kiloton uh, uh, uranium nuclear weapon was exploded over Hiroshima, killing about 60% of the population of the city immediately. And the story is, as you might imagine, a quite sobering story. And um, in the book, uh, Hershey goes on to uh, observe uh, Hiroshima for some 20 years after the bomb was dropped, going all the way into the 1960s. And he writes in the book, the story of Dr. Masakazu Fujii, who was a family medicine doc in Hiroshima prior to the bomb. And when the bomb went off, of course, his place was destroyed, but he survived and he, uh, uh, he went on to recreate his practice and really enjoy life. He was very bon vivant, loving fellow, enjoyed parties and booze and all these kinds of things. And life went on. He made a ton of money. And he um, and finally, after about 20 years, he took a trip to Tokyo. He was one of the survivors of the atomic bomb. And these were very special people in their nation. And they said, well, as long as you're here, why don't you come get a full physical exam and we'll use one of our new scanners and we will take uh, a full physical exam on you and just see how you're doing as one of the survivors of the atomic bomb. Well, they did the study, they did the scan, and they found out that he had a mass on his lung that was very serious. It was cancer and that he needed to have surgery. And so he goes in, has the surgery. They take out the mass successfully, but sadly, postoperatively, one of the stitches came off one of the vessels inside his chest and he began to bleed to death. Fortunately, the bleeding stopped, but he was in a very desperate physical condition in this post-operative state in hemorrhagic shock. <clears throat> and he began to finally improve, but he was profoundly depressed. He was, he felt absolutely horrible. And he was really just fully expecting to die and was so sad. And one of his children came to him and said, you know, as a physician in Japan, you take an oath, which is that medicine is the art of compassion. And you've taken that oath and taken care of so many people. Why can't you show that same compassion to yourself? Dr. Fujii took the advice, began to recover, and went on with his life as a physician in Japan. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning is the concept of that medicine is the art of compassion, that the thing that you are seeking out is a field that is actually an art form 
and it is defined by the improvement of the lives of, of others through your learning and applied science and becoming dedicated to the human condition. I will also say to you that your application to medical school has to show that you can prove that you have dedicated yourself uh, to the improvement of the human condition. There was an important uh, uh, statement by Nguyen who said that compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into the places of pain and to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out when those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion means the full immersion into the condition of being human. And so what I'd like to do now is share with you my path and I will tell you that when I uh, entered college, that I really, and this was in uh, 1970, I really could not have stated to you what I've said already so far about my proof that I was committed to the betterment of the human condition. And then I will share with, with you some thoughts about how, how we on the admissions committee at UT Southwestern, which I had been on for 10 years, uh, it, how we evaluate our candidates today. I'm actually sitting here on my birthday <laughs> in my hometown. I, I work in Dallas, Texas now, but I'm my, I keep my home here in the woods of Western Georgia in Douglasville, where I grew up. I went to the University of Georgia. Yes, that would be the number one football team in the United States right now as they go on to play Tennessee, I believe, today. Uh, I went to the Medical College of Georgia. I briefly enrolled in a general surgery program, and then I began practicing emergency medicine full time in 1978. And then I returned home in 1980, right here where I'm sitting for 20 years, I'll tell you about that, uh, to practice medicine in my hometown. I, wa I was the hometown boy come home. And then I joined the University of Texas Southwestern faculty almost 21 years ago. And I've been in the clinical practice of emergency medicine 44 years. While I was here in Georgia, I ran four emergency medicine groups. I built an urgent care center in my hometown. I was hometown boy come home. My father was a banker, my older brother a lawyer, my younger brother a broker, and I was the hometown doc. So I was the, I had the, I had the pleasure of being able to take care of people that I'd grown up with. And it was a wonderful uh, opportunity to be able to become part of my hometown again after getting uh, medical training. Along the way, I, I was part of a group of people back in 1985 that established the National e Emergency Medical Services Physicians Organization, which is now a formal subspecialty of medicine, uh, which is fellowship trained. Initially, I was very much on my own and self-taught as a physician. I need to tell you kids, we did not have the internet back in the 1970s. And so the only information I had as a clinical practitioner was either 10 year old dusty old textbooks sitting on a shelf or the docs on the telephone that I would call and pester and ask questions to do to. Today, ladies and gentlemen, you have every fact in the known universe in your pocket. Now see, I do not, here is my flip phone I have right here. Yes, I am a 69 year old man with a flip phone. Uh, only because I am surrounded by computers all the time. I was on Zoom 14 hours on Thursday, you know, so I, I can be surrounded by computers. So I've chosen not to have a smartphone in my pocket, at least not yet. <clears throat> but anyway, now I'm part of a formal training program as a faculty member in emergency medicine at UT Southwestern. The thing that's very, very apparent to me is what the great Harvard geologist and evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould said, he was a marvelous writer, a, an incredible speaker and a great scientist. And uh, I actually flew from Atlanta to College Station, Texas one time to get, hear him give a lecture, marvelous. Um, he said this, he said that the tape of life, if rewound, would not play the same way a second time. What he meant as an evolutionist is that there are just simply too many coincidences in the human condition in all of life. Um, that means that if, if you started things over, that so many coincidences occurred that 
the things would not occur the second the same way if if I had not changed my major 50 years and two months ago from pre-law to pre-medicine I would not be sitting here talking to you on this wonderful program today for example and so why go into medicine <clears throat> folks it's got four critical points why should you try this path first and foremost is compassion I'm 69 today I, I changed my major 50 years ago to medicine, and I will tell you, I love going to work. And what I learned over time is that I really enjoyed people. I really enjoyed the patients I take care of. If one does not do that, the risk is burnout. And so you must examine your own path to see if you, could, you can find in your heart true warm, committed, genuine interest in the lives of other people. You have to have that. This is not just a job. Speaking as a job, though, you have to have the work ethic. You already know that college is not easy. Well, medical school is not easy at all. You have to work your tail off in, in medical school so that you can then try to get into a residency where you then have to work so hard so that you can then get your career, possibly fellowship training, and then get your career established. Above all, it requires commitment. You can't just halfway do this because it is in the commitment that you become a clinician, but more importantly, through the application of medicine being the art of compassion, that you become a physician. And then lastly, Medicine is science. It is applied science. When I go into the emergency department and I find that there's something I don't know, which happens all the time, there's one of three reasons. I either never knew it, and there's plenty of that, or I forgot it, and wait till you get old, there's plenty you forget, or it's brand new stuff. And folks, you have to have to enter medicine a commitment to ongoing science. I had the pleasure of listening to a marvelous talk on sepsis from Washington University uh, a Department of uh, Critical Care yesterday, <coughs> excuse me, talking about what is being learned about sepsis and specifically about COVID, as well as about trauma critical care. And what continues to be learned is astonishing. So it must be that you take on to yourself a lifelong commitment on studying. Folks, when you apply to medical school, you have to prove that you are the professional, that you are asking the committee to believe that you are and you will become. You are applying for a $6 million job. You say, what do you mean? He says, well, it's $200,000 a year, more or less, for 30 years or $300,000 a year for 20 years. That's a $6 million job. And so the question I want to ask you, imagine that they, somebody hired you to become a hiring person for a company and you were interviewing the candidates for a six million dollar job and let's say that you had hundreds of candidates we have six thousand candidates applying to medical school at ut southwestern this year of which we invited only 800 to come interview for only 230 spots uh 10 percent of which we take from out of state how picky are we on the admissions committee? And so we look at the broad spectrum of the person who is applying in multiple ways. For example, we know that there are predictors that medical students will later get in trouble as doctors with the medical boards in their state. And what were the two predictors? Being late to work, why would you be late to a shift? The shift starts at 7 a.m., be there at 6.30. And failure to complete projects, including completing the projects on time. You say, well, my goodness, you know, where in fact did that kind of logic come from? And that's sort of what my old pappy who raised me right here where I'm sitting in the woods of Western Georgia, he said, people tell you all about themselves you ever want to know, you just have to pay attention. And so if medical students are late to their assignments and are not completing assignments on time, they're telling us all about themselves that we ever want to know, which is medicine just really isn't that important. 
So on the admissions committee, we want to find out about you. Can you demonstrate convincingly why you want to become a physician? Your grade point average is so important. The MCAT scores are so important. Your shadowing activities are so important. This is why we started virtual shadowing and why you started your program. What community service have you done? How can you, how can you show your social awareness? This is the in, in my long life, this is the most important time in the history of understanding equitability and responsibility to improving the condition for all people, regardless of ability to pay, race, and ethnicity. This is the most sensitive time. Can you demonstrate that? Can you demonstrate that you've been parts of teams and you're committed to teamwork? Medicine is all about teamwork. <clears throat> I, I'm not the only person in that ER at Parkland. Uh, I have residents, medical students, I have nursing staff, I have techs, I have secretaries and, uh, or uh, administrative staff. And then <clears throat> your letters of reference are very important. These have to be people that know you, that know who you are. Uh, as opposed to a letter like, well, Mr. Jones said he was in my, my biology 300 class, which I confirmed, and he got an A in the class, so that must mean he will be a good medical student, and so I'm comfortable in saying that he should do well in your program. Folks, that is a non-letter. You need to get to know your professors, your faculty, your lecturers, so that they and other folks that you've done social activities with, community service, so that they can demonstrate that, that they can document that you are who you said you're going to be. And then finally, folks, interviews. I list that last, but it it's really number one on the list. You must interview well. You must be able to talk about all the things that you've been involved with, uh, and especially about why you want to become a physician. You have to explain that and, and look the folks straight in the eye, even if it's on a virtual camera, and explain your commitment to helping improve the lives of others. And folks, you have to have this question already answered if it comes up. What will you do if you don't get in medical school? Because after all, if you are really, really committed to helping the lives of uh, helping improve the lives of others, if you're not going, if you can't do it as a clinician, then how would you do it in another area such as public health, other social activities, and so forth? To learn applied science so that you can work to the uh, to helping others. Now look, don't do anything stupid. The ways that you will likely not get into medical school are driving under the influence, getting busted for on-campus alcohol or some substance violation getting arrested for abusive or violent behavior like drunk and disorderly. Really, it's anything that you end up having to write an explanation for that includes, since then I have learned that actions matter and I will be much more careful in the future. Folks, we're hiring you for a $6 million job and a $6 million professional is going to be a growing young adult who can control himself or herself and knows that he doesn't want to make a mistake that will possibly prevent a future career. <clears throat> but medical school is a lot of work. You're just getting started when you get into medical school. You have to make great grades and do well on your step exams to then figure out what it is that you want to do with your life because you will be applying for a residency before you know it. And then, folks, you have to hunt for a job. Job opportunities for the folks that we're, we're graduating in emergency medicine from our residency program at Southwestern where the opportunities were really down this past year. There are a lot of reasons. Competition from uh, nursing practitioners and other advanced practice professionals, physician assistants, or now called physician associates, and so forth. So you will have to prove one day after your training that someone wants to hire you or you want to start your own job. And somewhere between 50 and 60% of physician professionals today are employed by someone else. They're not starting their own offices. What about taking a gap year? Sure, do it. But don't just take a gap year as a student that I reviewed for the committee recently said, well, I really just wanted to get my mental health together and take some time for myself. You have to treat a gap year as if you're getting a master's. I would suggest taking at least a course every semester you know, that's called post-baccalaureate work. I would strongly suggest doing that and making straight A's in post-bac work. 
we definitely definitely look at uh, grades trends. So do have a plan in a gap year. Now, what about the feel of what I do? Uh, what is burnout? Let's talk about that first. Burnout is a condition where people get here are medical professionals who have sworn they help. They want to help the conditions of other people. And yet they get tired of taking care of sick people. How did that happen? How did they stop being interested in their jobs? Did they lose the art of compassion or maybe they never actually really had it? There's so many opportunities now to be able to see the lives of others. We've done the virtual shadowing.com and this wonderful program that we have the pleasure of, of joining this morning uh, is another great example of how virtual opportunities really are of great value. Um, on the admissions committee, we are seeing many of our candidates showing up now with virtual uh, the online uh, shadowing opportunities and submitting those uh, for their applications process. Uh, and we've had quite a bit of impact in the, in the program that Aditya and I are work, working on, 36 nations, over a thousand universities, uh, over 46,000 pre-health students. We've had 77 sessions. So the stuff is out there. Your wonderful programs, I think you would have 35 or 36. So that's how many I counted on your website. Um, and, uh, and, not just the programs that we put online, we've had over 500,000 viewings of the programs. So we know that the shadowing opportunities are very popular. We, we watch the trends of the participants as, uh, as we monitor those. And so I wanna tell you then in, a, in the next 20 minutes about a quick sort of run about things I have learned in emergency medicine and just share a few anecdotes here and there to give you an idea about my life. And so these are some medical tips for the future that I call Fowler's 15 laws of safe medicine. Now, you have to examine the patient. I have to go in the room, look at the vital signs, look at the condition of the patient, how they're reacting to pain in their condition, what kind of support group they have, take a history, which is easy in English for me, a bit harder in Spanish, but also it may be Arabic, or Urdu, or Mandarin Chinese. How do we solve these issues of communication in a very busy emergency department? These are challenges. My residents all know Fowler's first law, always explain a tachycardia, Don't and, uh, meaning that really if the vital signs are abnormal, you have to see them. There was a study done at UT Southwestern a few years ago that showed that one in five patients discharged from American hospitals had abnormal vital signs on discharge. Well, golly, folks, I mean, the greatest predictor that a patient will return to, for medical care uh, in, in an emergency is if the vital signs were abnormal on discharge. And then a corollary to this is don't depend on the presence of an elevated pulse rate to determine that an emergency is present. You must look at the whole patient. You do a history, you do a physical, you order appropriate diagnostic studies, you create a, um, a differential diagnosis of what could all be going on, you determine a treatment course, you prescribe the treatment, <clears throat> and then you arrange for follow-up for the patient. The next one, and this was given to me way back over 30 years ago, it isn't what it isn't. That is, it isn't what you've already ruled out. It's what it might be that will get you in trouble and will hurt your patient. In medicine, you have to complete a differential diagnosis loosely described as, I think it's this, it could be this, I don't think it's this, and I know it's not this. Well, Right now, as you're sitting there listening to me ramble, over 20% of your body's total rest energy is being consumed by the brain. The brain is a high energy organ. It's the highest energy organ in the body. Well, when you're under the mental processes of creating a, a complex differential diagnosis, that uses enormous, amount of, enormous amounts of energy. Well, imagine that you're 11 hours into a 12 hour shift your feet are killing you, you're hypoglycemic, you've got to pee, the baby ain't got no shoes, the old lady's on your back, the mortgage is due, you've got a lot on your mind and you want to get out of there. 
Are you going to make yourself complete a complex differential diagnosis with all that on your mind? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the difference between a generalist and average physician and a specialist in a field is in the rigor of the application of a differential diagnosis. You don't want to be an average clinician. You want to be a great doctor. We're not heroes. We do not have to prove that the patient will do well as an outpatient, meaning being discharged. We have to be concerned that they may not do well. There are lots of reasons why people may not do well, and they're demonstrating it to you. Abnormal vital signs, weakness, inability to complete the activities of daily living, uh, living all the way from getting into and out of the bed to peeing and pooping to being able to uh, eat and dress and so forth. And you're saying, you mean that in a missile, in the middle of a busy shift, Fowler, you've got to determine if a little old lady is so frail that she may not do well at home. And that's correct. I have to worry that she may not do well. And so I will, I, I have a very strong impulse to find reasons to put people in the hospital. This one seems a little silly, but pay attention to your physical exam. When someone has had a traumatic event of some sort, let's say they twisted their ankle and you go down and look at that ankle, ankle, folks, if it's blue and swollen, it's broken. I don't care what the x-ray show. You say, well, you mean you have to trust your own bedside judgment over the x-ray that you have taken? That's correct. And so the point I'm making on this is your developing of clinical skills at the bedside, paying attention to your clinical skills, and even in spite of the study that you order, being able to use your clinical skills to gain the experience to make a decision is absolutely vital. You have a little old lady, she has fallen, her hip is hurting. Your x-ray is normal, but she can't move that hip. Folks, that hip is broken. I don't care what that x-ray shows. You must be careful. Uh, another point, and I've seen this happen, never send home a sleepy baby that doesn't come to full wakefulness. You have a kid comes in with a fever, and you're looking the kid over, and the kid's really sleeping in his mother's arms. And uh, you say, oh, well, I don't see a rash. The ears look fine. The throat looks fine. But the kid doesn't really do anything except really want to slumber there. His diaper is dry and is really not nursing much. Uh, folks, don't send that baby home. That, that baby has got something wrong with it. And, uh, and if you decide to give that baby a dose of medicine and he, he vomits that dose, you'd be very careful unless you've seen the lumbar punct puncture spinal tap results, that kid has got something wrong. The problem is kids are so small and they have so much anatomy and physiology in that tiny little frame of theirs that it may be easy to miss something. So be careful because number six, once the patient is out the door, you have lost control of that situation. I'm an EMS guy. <clears throat> I deal with uh, paramedics and EMS systems in the field. You would like to think sort of that every time 911 is called, a patient is transported to the hospital, but that's not at all the case. We will, 911 will be called, we'll go out lights and sirens, a patient will be evaluated, and as much as half the time in big EMS systems, a patient is not, is not <clears throat> excuse me, is not transported to the hospital, which means that once the medic doesn't transport that patient, they have lost control of the situation. So be careful. Once that patient is out the door, you have lost control of the situation. I always recommend giving the first dose of medication in the emergency department. I think that's a good habit to get into, especially if the patient may have trouble finding funding for their medications. Be a, you must be a fierce advocate for the needs of your patient. Um, a, a, a resident candidate uh, actually was kind of interviewing me back last year. I did 100 interviews last year, a uh, busy year in 2020. And the resident said, well, what are the two things that you would fix about Parkland Emergency Department? And I said, I'll tell you exactly what those are. Um, let's say that I have a guy at, at Saturday afternoon who has giant eye pus, you know, goo on his eye and something's really wrong. I call the ophthalmologist, he comes down, sees the patient, and he said, here, give him this prescription. I think it's about $200 and tell him to come to my office at two o'clock on Saturday if he can get insurance. 
folks, that didn't help me or the patient at all. If they can't get the medicine and if they can't get into the after visit, we haven't helped them at all. We must be a fierce advocate for the needs of our patients. And thus, the two things I would fix is that I would be able to hand the patient the medications. Um, I, I may sound like a liberal, but I think that that's exactly the right thing to do. Here are your medicines. And I would also be able to say, and here is your appointment. Just call and tell them you're coming uh, and you will be seen for follow-up regardless of ability to pay. In the emergency department, as we talk to the patient, look at them, uh, do the physical examination, uh, order studies, laboratory work, x-rays, other imaging, and create a differential diagnosis, we have to really find out what the real emergency is. For example, the, uh, the lady who was here, young woman, because she's burning when she, when she pees and she's kind of quiet, doesn't say a whole lot. And have you ever had urinary tract infection? No. Are you sexually active? She, and she gets really quiet and just avoids the question and doesn't want to talk. And you say, well, is there anything that you would like to talk to me privately here with the door shut? Are things safe at home? And it comes to find out that, in fact, she has been sexually assaulted by a neighbor, that she is too embarrassed to get the police involved. And in fact, the urinary tract infection and possibly a sexually transmitted disease is really the second issue. We're going to treat it, but it's a second issue to her safety as an individual. So we have to find out what the real uh, uh, real emergency is. I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. You'll have to forgive me. Sorry. Um, here we go because we have two responsibilities in the ER. Is there an emergency present, some emergency medical condition? And if so, is it a life-threatening emergency? And figure it out. What is the best diagnosis you can make? Ladies and gentlemen, in this rambling talk I'm giving you today, I am saying to you that in your interest of bettering the human condition, you are becoming a clinical diagnostician an average physician gives an average opinion. An expert specialist will figure out the problem. I encourage you to go online and look at the New England Journal of Medicine sometime soon and go to the Clinical Pathological Conferences, CPCs, and read any one of them or listen to any one or just one, where they invite the pro in who knows everything, everything about the condition knows all the literature published on that condition, let's say it's septic shock or bacterial emergencies, knows the people who wrote them and, and so forth. We can't all be those kinds of experts. In emergency medicine, we see every condition of every age, every gender, every ethnicity, uh, uh, every, every racial group at all hours of the days. Uh, medics do it in outside the hospital in the blowing rain at four o'clock in the morning. And our job is to try to make the best assessment that we can. This was told me back in 1975 by Dr. Wally, who was chief resident on surgery. And this is some of the best advice I ever got. You talk to a patient, you examine them, you order studies, and you still don't know what's going on. Go back and talk to the patient. When in doubt, take more history, continue your interview with your patient. And then develop a physical exam that you trust and always do it. I cannot tell you that I, I have worked with every one of the 500 residents that have been through our program in now 21 years at UT Southwestern. And the number of times that these very smart clinicians in training leave out steps uh, of the physical examination, I see it all the time. Example is neck vein distension also known as jugular venous distension. I'm talking of the neck veins in the neck. And they'll examine a person with shorter breath and they listen to the chest and they check the vital signs and they haven't looked for jugular venous distension, which would be a sign of central vascular volume overload. And I say, go back and look at the neck veins for two reasons. Number one, so that they know that that was important to me and I can't make a decision without it but number two, so that they will develop a physical exam that they trust. Um, 
what is the most common cause of tachycardia that I see in the emergency department? It's probably drugs of some sort, uh, a chemical uh, such as albuterol that we give for wheezing, and then probably drugs. We see a lot of methamphetamine use, a lot of cocaine use, but then also sepsis, which is a central um, uh, infection due to bacteria or viruses uh, or other organisms in the bloodstream. What's the most common cause of a bradycardia? Probably beta blockers. What I'm saying to you on this slide is you have to look at your patient and gain an overall sense of understanding why vital signs may be unusual. Um, an abnormal, excuse me, a normal electrocardiogram rules out nothing. You've got a patient with chest pain, they've got a normal uh, EKG, ECG. Keep looking until you find out the reason. If you haven't determined the reason, you haven't completed the assessment on your patient. And then the last of the 15 laws, an altered mental state is someone who is just not right in terms of the way they're responding to you always means that something is wrong unless you can prove it otherwise. And the corollary is, is it dementia? That is, is it, an, uh, say, an older person uh, or a younger person with pre-senile dementia? Or is it delirium? And one of the ways you can tell about delirium, for example, uh, psychotic patients uh, who are schizophrenic tend to hear things. Delirious patients tend to see things. So those are just some examples. And then I wanted just to throw this in as additional. There are so many points to having a safe and successful career. <clears throat> this is something over the last several years that I, Ray here, has added to what I do. I talk to the patient. I, I take a look at them, do a physical exam. I order appropriate studies. And then I begin to develop a differential diagnosis and then I sit down in front of, we use EPIC, the electronic medical record, and I have a focus moment, which is so hard to do because both phones are ringing, the patient is in there screaming, the nurses won't shut up laughing and cutting up at the station, and the consultant that you've been trying to reach is picking right now to come talk to me at the nurse's station. I clear all that out and look at me. I look at the chart one more time. I go through all the results. I make sure I'm familiar with the past medical history because any one of those things, uh, if you leave it out or just sort of gloss through it, uh, would be something that, you, that might harm the patient. The second is protect the frail. We have to be able to determine that people can conduct their activities of daily living and that they are really able to conduct their own lifestyles. And so we have to really surround patients with loving arms to be able to assess their ability to care for themselves. That is part of your job. <clears throat> the next one will seem silly, but it's true. Folks, eliminate the first person singular pronoun. I did this and I did this and I did this. That's one of the worst written essays that I ever see uh, for the admissions committee of people who talk about in the first person, well, I did this and I did that. In life, to be with people, eliminate the first person singular. Instead, you use the first person plural, we. We are a team. And you use the second person plural, you, only to say, I am so proud of you. These are the ways. You must be really nice to people, kill off your ego, be there to be a member of a team, to work to helping others. Also, don't say stupid things. This has been one of the things, you know, I have a big mouth. <laughs> and, you know, don't say something that you're going to regret. Just don't say it. Just back off, say less, um, and just be careful because you, you don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Um, I would add a corollary to that. You're going to see many, many sick people in your career. I see new onset cancer of very sick people all the time in the emergency department. And uh, don't destroy their hope. Do not destroy the patient's hope. That's often all they have left. And when you destroy their hope, the life crumbles around them. So don't take, them, don't take that away from them. 
So those 15 plus things were a gift for you from me. And I'll be happy to take uh, uh, any questions that you might have. I think we got it right at 1040. Uh, uh, so uh, what questions? And I will get out of my slides here. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much for your kind advice, Dr. Fowler. If anyone has any questions, they can feel free to ask now and we'll now begin our Q&A session. So our first question is, where did you complete your residency training? That, that's a great question. I did the first year of a surgery, uh, what was called a straight surgery internship at the Medical College of Georgia. And I left that and started working ER full-time in 1978. You could do that in those days, 44 years ago. Uh, I then went on to become board certified in emergency medicine through the American Board of Emergency Medicine in 1985 in what was called practice eligibility. You could do that in those days. You cannot do that any longer. You have to be residency trained now. Thank you. Our next question is, um, what is what primarily inspired you to pursue emergency medicine over other specialties? This is where that Stephen Jay Google line about... Uh, the tape of life, if rewound, would not play the same way a second time. I came out of the surgery program just not happy with it. I didn't enjoy it. And I was offered a job working ER full time. You could do it in those days. <laughs> it was in, the ER group where I was offered was being run by a psychiatrist that had taught me in um, my training in psychiatry. And he actually left his field and went into emergency medicine. You could do that in those days, 40 years ago. You can't do that now. Um, I, I was blessed to get into a job that I found astonishingly ch challenging. I mean, it is all the way from newborn babies to very old people with strokes and all conditions in between. I found emergency medicine extremely challenging. And so I was very much on the job trained which you always will be in any career. You won't learn everything in medical school or your residency, and you will continue to study uh, all of your career. Good question. Next one. Thank you. Our next question is, do you feel like you normally have enough time to counsel patients even during busy days in the ER? I am blessed. In uh, I've had two careers. My first half of my career was here in my hometown in, in private ER, working for private hospitals. The second half of my career has been as part of a medical school faculty and residency training program. I am blessed that we have residents to work with. And so therefore I have help in there from the physician's perspective. I find that even in our big busy ER, I'm, I mostly have enough time to be able to go sit with patients even if for a few minutes. Um, that can be extremely challenging. That can be extremely challenging when you have the setting, say, of a private ER group uh, where your patient throughput, the, how quickly you get patients through the emergency department is something that you're scored or even paid on <clears throat> or even might lose your job on. And so I think that the broader answer to that question is that one of the things that perhaps lacks a bit less in medicine today is clinicians physicians, NPs, PAs, who will really take some time and communicate with a patient to make sure that they understand what it is we think is going on and what it is we want them to do about it and how to get follow-up for that condition. I would really also add how to get tied into aftercare. We see so many patients in the emergency department who have never been seen before at our big busy hospital and we're the busiest emergency department in the United States. And and yet they still don't have uh, any ongoing primary care. Uh, I was pleased to uh, see uh, our host this evening who is working in uh, telemedicine, which I think is absolutely one of the growing methods of the future by which we'll be able to, to uh, see, talk to, and to some degree examine patients, but also to counsel them as well. Good question. Thank you. Our next question is, what is the difference between shock trauma centers and emergency departments? Uh, they're overlapping. Um, there are many types. There are hospitals that specialize in types of care. By and large, any general hospital you walk into is going to have an emergency department, and that will see any kind of case. 
hospitals, especially large hospitals that are in large communities, <clears throat> excuse me, um, will commonly have trauma teams. They will have cardiac teams for taking care of such things as heart attacks and doing cardiac catheterizations. They will have stroke teams. Uh, they were, will deliver babies and so forth. And so <clears throat> virtually all hospitals have emergency departments staffed by emergency physicians. It is the larger, more central facilities, typically in downtown large cities, uh, that actually have trauma teams as well. And as, as you know, in the setting of Baltimore, shock trauma teams uh, that are able to care for the critically acutely injured patients. <clears throat> Thank you. What could be the cause of complete heart block in ischemic heart disease? It's a great question. <clears throat> Invite me back and I'll give you a, uh, I'll give you a uh, quick course on reading electrocardiography. The answer is, is that the heart is composed of uh, two main parts, which is the muscle and the nerves within the heart. The nerves within the heart have a primary pacemaker at the top, a middle pacemaker in the middle, and then two wires called bundle branches that go down through the middle of the heart known as the septum. The left coronary, there are two coronary arteries, two heart arteries. <clears throat> the left coronary gives a blood supply to the septum of the heart where the two bundle branches, the two wires that communicate from the top of the heart to the bottom run. If you clot off the left anterior descending artery, you can infarct, which means kill the septum of the heart and the two wires that go through there. And so thus a heart attack can completely block what ner nerve conduction from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart, resulting in the condition known as complete heart block. The effect of that is the heart slows down pacing cells to drive the heart are much more limited in the, uh, in the ventricles. And in fact, the manifestation of that may be that the heart may stop altogether, which is a term called asystole, which means no heart contraction, which is cardiac arrest. This is why that as many as 30% of people experiencing an acute heart attack may go into cardiac arrest. Thank you. What is the prognosis of cardiac arrest patients who have been resuscitated? It's a great question. Uh, it depends on the city and the EMS system. There are two types of people who have cardiac arrest. Those that do so outside the hospital at home is the most common. <clears throat> Excuse me, place of business is second most common. And those that have cardiac arrest inside the hospital. Let's use the cardiac arrest inside, inside the hospital first. Patients are in hospitals because they're sick, which means they have some underlying medical condition. For example, the biggie right now is COVID. Well, uh, so patients in the hospital are already sick. And then on top of that, their heart stops, either ventricular, ventricular fibrillation or pulseless electrical activity or asystole, uh, ventricular tachycardia is another subset. Um, the hope is that they will be discovered quickly that the team can come and resuscitate them. In the hospital, cardiac arrest resuscitations tend to run a little worse than folks outside the hospital. In terms of folks outside the hospital, the single most important thing that must be done is that someone recognizes that the patient has collapsed and they get on the chest and do CPR quickly. Uh, the most important thing in the first few minutes is just to get on the chest and push at a rate of about 100. At a, at a rate of about the song, you would say, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. That's how fast you push. You don't need to ventilate for the first, say, four or five minutes. There's enough oxygen in the red blood cells of the patient that collapses that if you will just move the blood, the blood around, that you'll improve the patient's outcome. And at the same time, somebody needs to call for help and get the emergency medical service responding. It takes them a while to get there, five, 10, 12 minutes. Um, and uh, if the patient is in ventricular fibrillation where the heart has suddenly started gyrating and has lost the ability to pump, and if the patient receives citizen CPR prior to EMS arrival, 
then the survival of these patients could be as high as 30 to 35 percent, as reported uh, by uh, one of the great EMS systems in the nation in the history of the world, Seattle Fire Department. If the patient has suddenly collapsed into asystole, where the heart is not moving at all, those patients tend to not do so well. Their outcome may be 13 to 15 percent. So the important critical things are whether it occurs in the hospital or outside the hospital. And outside the hospital, it is so important that we and you as future physicians get involved in programs to help, help citizens learn CPR so that they can help their loved ones. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Fowler. And now we have a few questions about COVID-19. So our first one is, how do you stay up to date on new research for novel treatments of COVID-19 or other cases you regularly see in the ER? That's a great question. Um, as someone who is spending the last half, last half of his career as an academic, <clears throat> and, and also, forgive my horse throat today, <clears throat> and also as someone who is just very interested in medicine, um, I feel that it's essential for me to stay up on the things that I see a lot of. I have read more about COVID in the last two years than I've read about anything since medical school. I, I read about it every single day. I have multiple sources that I read. New England Journal, Journal of Amer American Medical Association, and many others. <clears throat> the answer, the, the issue about COVID is that this is a brand new disease that we really are not exactly sure what it's attacking in the body. We know how it gets into the body through the ACE2 receptors in the nose and in the uh, oral pharynx. But where exactly it lands in the body, what tissue is not exactly certain. Yes, we know it goes to the lungs and causes pneumonia and causes sepsis, other multi-organ issues. COVID is probably an endotheliopathy. The endothelium is the tissue that lines all the blood vessels in the body. COVID seems to be attacking the endothelium, which means it attacks the blood vessels that line all organs. For example, the brain doesn't seem to be directed uh, attacked direct, start over, the neurons of the brain do not seem to be attacked directly by COVID, but rather that the blood vessels of the brain are attacked by COVID. Well, <clears throat> the blood vessels, the, the lining of the blood vessels, the endothelium is a very complex tissue that is directly involved with the clotting system, what is known as the coagulation pathways, and also the, uh, uh, among other things, the immune system and the activation of inflammatory pathways. So if you go in, so if a virus goes in and infects the endothelium, it can cause blood vessels to clot. That is a known problem, pulmonary emboli, uh, brain clotting, strokes, um, and inflammatory pathways get set, uh, set up, specifically the activation of NF kappa B, never mind what that is, ultimately act, uh, activating interferon six, never mind what that is, you'll get all of that in medical school soon. Um, and the clear, most important thing today is vaccination. I am vaccinated. I'll be taking the booster next month. Uh, a girl I was dating here for, we've not been dating long, 32 years, will not take the vaccine. Two of my brothers will not take the vaccine. And I go, are you crazy? As of this, this moment, over 7.3 billion doses of the vaccines, the various vaccines have been given worldwide. Um, it is the safest, it's not really a treatment, it, it is a medication. It is the safest medication that medicine has ever proven to have offered anywhere in the history of mankind, except that this odd anti-vaxxer thing of which I am making no judgment. People have a right to make decisions about their health care, about their own health care. But if your health care can affect the health of others, for example, if you have elderly parents and you might be carrying COVID virus back to them and you might kill them, I think that's a very foolish thing. I'm writing a paper, Adidia and I are writing a paper <clears throat> with a, a lovely gentleman named Henry, who's a high school student down in Houston, about the, about the, the civic duty to participate in helping protect the public. And I believe that with all of my heart. I got it from my father. He was a very civic, responsible uh, man. And so the vaccination is critical. What is 
uh, I have been in medicine, uh, uh, actually in medicine 48 years. I, I turned my major 50 years ago. This is the worst epic epidemic by far that we have ever seen. 760,000 Americans have been killed by COVID in three big waves in less than two years. And if you will look at the Johns Hopkins website, which I look at three times a day, and I have been now for almost two years, you will see that we've seen the big peak of the third peak, but it's also flattened out. And that areas in the Midwest, Michigan notably, Arizona is another, are seeing uh, the end states in general, Minnesota, um, are seeing upticks uh, in, the, uh, in the outbreaks. And so this thing, folks, is not over. The cases are spiking in Russia to the point where the CDC has declared Russia as a level four precautionary measure. Don't travel there. Germany is having a terrible spike in their, in their uh, cases right now. And so this thing is not over. This is a new virus that we don't understand. Uh, we, there is hope on the horizon for the new Pfizer uh, drug. Um, the, Merck, let me, the Merck drug first, Molnupiravir, which will be an oral drug used to uh, treat COVID. It's actually a therapeutic, uh, which will give some hope. However, it's been only a 50% reduction in death overall, though a higher percentage of reduction in people that are at higher risk. And Pfizer has a new product based with two drugs, one of which is ritonavir, which is an HIV drug that uh, is reported as much as an 89% decrease in death rates uh, of people at high risk. Now, the problem is, folks, is that these drugs are probably going to cost for four or five pills $1,000. I'm not kidding. These are going to be extremely expensive drugs. Medicare announced yesterday that it's raising the rates of Medicare insurance <clears throat> due to, among other things, the anticipated cost of covering these drugs. So we are not out of the woods yet. There, uh, I'll leave it with one thought. There are two words, epidemic, which means the outbreak uh, across a population, in this case, a pandemic across the nations of the world. Typically, in a bad flu season in America, we see 75,000 deaths in a bad flu season. In a year and a half, we've seen 760,000 deaths. This is a terrible outbreak, a terrible epidemic. And then it becomes endemic, which means it's an infection that doesn't go away. We as physicians and you as coming physicians may well be having to face, you likely will be having to face, unless the population becomes more vaccinated, that COVID is a new disease that has showed up. We've seen that before. Legionella, for example, Le uh, Legionella pneumonia, and I could give you several others uh, that have shown up over the years that are new diseases that we had to, to work with. That was a very long answer. I'm sorry, but uh, this is a subject, obviously, in, on the front lines of the ER I'm very interested in. No worries, thank you. Our next question is also about COVID. Is COVID-19 lung damage reversible? The short answer is no. The lung damage is still after a year and a half, more, more than almost two years. And the finest minds in the history of, of technology and medicine in the world studying this. I can't emphasize how important all the textbooks should be. Think of all the fine minds. The best minds in the world are working on this, and we still don't understand the disease well. What we know is the blood vessels are attacked in the lungs, uh, the lung tissue, which then are adjacent in the alveoli, and in the bronchioles, which lead to the alveoli, develop an inflammatory component, whether it's primary or secondary is not certain. And a Cairo syrup, you know what that is, Cairo syrup, you know, the clear stuff you put on stuff, you may not know it, yeah, but thick, thick, clear syrup, goo, shows up in the lungs. It's almost like a liquid plastic. It's very poorly understood. And we know that there are awful long-term effects of terrible lung damage that may improve over time, but they may not. So 
again, I emphasize that it's just so really important that people get vaccinated. I strongly encourage you to get vaccinated. I'm putting my mouth, my body where my mouth is. I'm getting my booster next month. I want to take one last one. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. And as a follow up to COVID vaccines, have you personally seen patients who receive the COVID vaccine and still get COVID pneumonia? Absolutely. Um, but the but the incidence is reduced by about 92 percent in terms of the absolute risk. <clears throat> and um, it is also generally speaking that if they've been vaccinated, they tend to do better. Uh, in the hospital, and so that the risk of dying, even if they get pneumonia, is much, much less. Um, it is such a sensitive subject. Never in the, never in my lifetime, and I'm an old man now. Uh, last year of my seventh decade, uh, as of today, um, I've never seen us focusing more on cultural sensitivity and the rights of others. It's such, and that's such a very important thing. But there are patients or other clinicians who have said, well, don't even ask them if they've been vaccinated because then you may be judging them. And I'm going, I'm saying, well, no, I'm asking them if they're vaccinated for the same reason if they step on a nail, I want to, I want to know if they had the tetanus uh, vaccine or not. I'm asking them if they've been va vaccinated about COVID to say, well, maybe they won't do as badly, but it's actually become a culturally sensitive issue and it is not yet resolved. Well, what a great group. I thoroughly enjoyed being with you today. I, uh, Aditi and I are, I, I'm sorry, Aditi, I, I didn't let you talk much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Fowler. We really appreciate okay. your time. And we had one last question about your work-life balance. Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm a single guy, never got married, no kids, as opposed to right across the valley, right uh, that I can see over here is my next older brother who's not vaccinated who was an attorney, he's a lovely guy. He was state champ in the two mile in high school, uh, who is happily married for almost 40 years. He has uh, 15 grandchildren. <laughs> so he has, an, they have a family of 20 when they get together. So I, I'm a single guy. I married medicine and uh, it's been a jealous master, but I keep coming back to it. I'm blessed that I really enjoy medicine. The best thing I do in my life is seeing patients. And I swear to you, I'm sincere about that. I, I really enjoy being with patients. It is, however, so important that you have to take time for yourself. You have, one has to uh, have things develop that one enjoys. Um, I, I, I've been blessed to meet some of the Nobel laureates that we have at Southwestern. And one of them, we were sitting around at the faculty bar. <laughs> we actually have a faculty club bar. Uh, don't tell anybody. One day, several years ago, having uh, a non-alcoholic beverage. And, uh, I said, Mike, uh, are you ever going to retire? He's in his 80s now. Or are you just going to be found stiff and cold in your office one day? And we both laughed about that. And, and he gave me a piece of advice that I'll close with this. He said, never retire until, unless you have compelling interests at home, whatever those may be. Uh, anything from cutting the grass to reading books to building things or whatever those are so that you round out your life with other compelling interests other than just the sciences. So I love to read about quantum physics. I love to read about American history. Uh, there's so much to learn. And uh, I, I think that it helps me work on that work-life work balance. Thank you again for having us today. I I'm, I'm really admire what you're doing. And thank you for bringing tele, teleshadowing to the world. It's very important. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you very much, Dr. Fowler. <laughs> we really appreciate you taking the time to answer all of our questions. Um, this was a really informative learning session for all of us, and I love everyone to please give a warm thank you to Dr. Fowler in the chat box for this incredibly important <laughs> session. Um, and I know you have your program. We've got a couple of fun ones coming up. Uh, I would direct you to one great guy. Thank you for the chats, by the way. Uh, there's a fellow Tuesday, I don't know when it is, it's in a couple of weeks, I believe, is Dr. Adam Brenner. He's a psychiatrist at UT Southwestern and he's on the admissions committee also. And he is the Sigmund Freud you probably would want to hear. So if, if you've got time, I think you might enjoy uh, uh, joining us and we look forward to joining you. And thank you for all the birthday wishes, Minahala. Um, uh, all right. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Bye. Thanks again, doctor. Now we're going to conduct our closing session with our quiz and future session dates. The link to the quiz for this session is now live. The deadline for our future quizzes has been extended to one week after each session. And again, you'll need to have a 70% or higher to, re to pass and receive certification. The quiz is now linked in the chat. Uh, don't forget to join our mailing list if you haven't already, as we send session and quiz reminders right to your mailbox. You can join right now from the link in the chat or at teleshadowing.com slash join. Now onto our next session dates. These dates will also be posted throughout our social media outlets and be, so be sure to follow us at Teleshadowing on social media. I'm looking forward to seeing you all at our next session on Saturday, November 20th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with our physician mentoring us in family medicine. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's session, and we hope to see you in upcoming sessions. This, this concludes this week's shadowing.